Hello, this is Graphic Policy Radio, and this is your host, Ilana Levin. This is a comics podcast for the sort of nerds who realize that there are dangers to the fact that so many of the most popular collectively created stories in the world are considered the intellectual property of a handful of companies. For the sort of nerds who love our paladins and tieflings, but can also recognize the botched role when they see one. That's right. Today we are looking at some huge news from the world of tabletop role-playing games, and I'm interviewing a journalist who broke that news, Linda Codega. Now, I know a lot of listeners here may not play tabletop role-playing games themselves, so I'm not going to get super wonky into that lingo. This is a non-players-friendly podcast, but I really think that there's implications in this evolving story that are much bigger than just the world of folks who roll the d20 dice. I think there's a lot in here that is relevant to comics fans and fans of science fiction and all that other good stuff. Now, this also isn't the first time I've covered tabletop RPGs here. For one thing, I've had Kieran Gillen on a few times to talk about Die, his comic series, and about games in general. And in fact, earlier during the ongoing COVID pandemic, I did an episode specifically for people who were looking to get into the hobby new or learning to start doing it online. Um, and I had folks from One Shot Test Kitchen podcast and D20 Dames on to join that. If you're looking f- to get into the hobby yourself, that is a great place to begin is by listening to that episode. Um, I'll have a link in the show notes. Now, this news story we're talking about today is also a moving target with news breaking as recently as the day I'm recording this, which is Saturday, <laughs> January 14th. And making this podcast is my hobby. It is not my job. So I can't promise that I will be able to publish this before there are any new developments in the story, which means that this is up to date as of the time that Linda and I are talking. But please keep following the developments from Linda as Linda reports it for io9 and Gizmodo. That will be the most up-to-date news. And without further ado, let's say hello to Linda Codega. Hello. Hello. Linda is an entertainment journalist at io9 who covers fandom, film, books, and tabletop role-playing games. They are an avid sailor, gamer, and author, and when they aren't online, you can find them in the mountains or on the river. Welcome to the show. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Well, before we go into the specific news here, how did you get into tabletop RPGs? Uh, When I was young, I was very much into fandom, and I loved writing fan fiction. My parents can tell you that I wrote fan fiction when I was 10, which is like absolutely bonkers. But basically from fan fiction, I went to role-playing game forums where basically you would be able to like find a forum for the film or the book that you were really interested in and role-play within that community and that world. So it was a Mm. combination of like role-playing games and fandom. And then from there, it got to like the dice and paper games that were Mm -hmm. like very popular, like when I was in college mostly so college was when i started playing the kind of role-playing games that a lot of people think of with dice and character sheets and combat yeah yeah um and how did you start doing games journalism i was doing other kinds of writing for other companies i was marketing for a nonprofit, and then i got hired to be a reporter for this small magazine that reported on commercial films not like films that are commercialized but like commercials that are also funded by like bfw or whatever oh yeah yeah (laughs) yeah so while i was doing that i was like you know i could probably take what i've learned and start pitching what i'm really interested in which is games to other outlets so um i went to tour.com and I went to Observer and I pitched articles. I just did some freelance writing and eventually I was able to land a job at io9 where that became my full-time writing position. That's so great. And it's so great to have like journalists covering this so we're not just getting like fan emotional feedback like there's actual mm-hmm. research and reportage going on. Yeah, I think that that's something that I won't say has been missing from tabletop role-playing games because there have been journalists covering games for a long time. But I think that popularizing that coverage is a fairly new development and has pretty Mm. much only happened over the past like year or two. It's one of those things where video games are getting, are obviously like getting a lot of coverage and have been for a while. 
but I think that tabletop role playing games were sort of able to slip under the radar at the big nexus points during their life cycle. So they just mm-hmm. never quite made it to the front page. And there's a lot of people who have dismissed tabletop role playing games throughout the years. So it just never kind of got the the intense journalistic scrutiny that it's it, it needs to mm-hmm. to grow as like a bunch of companies who control IPs and are trying to dictate how people, you know, tell stories. There's always something flashier, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because like I we really are in this moment where more people are playing and talking about them than ever ever before and it's just really broadened the audience of people who might care about these sorts of stories in the first place. Mhm. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's the fact that the audience is not only there, but plugged in and cares about what companies are doing. Because for so long, if people didn't like what Dungeons and Dragons were doing, they would do something else or they would just, you know, make up their own games. It's one of those things where it's pretty funny that this company is trying to exert control over its community. And I'm like, this is a community of players that read the rule book and throw it away. What are you doing? Mm. Yeah, I guess in some ways, the very networked nature of the community and people's roles as creators themselves makes it a particularly prone to being able to build resistance against something that they don't like or don't want to see. Yeah, I think I think it's a double-edged sword. I think that Often people get into the into clicks. You know, it's like any fandom. People have their favorites and sort of stick by stick by the man when they want to. But this has been a pretty remarkable instance of all of the content creators that have previously been in their own siloed uh, clicks and have their own opinions and have their own following, sort of banding together in a very very clear denouncement of what Dungeons and Dragons is doing right now, which is. I don't I don't want to say unprecedented, but I do want to say that it's like I've never seen this happen quite at this level from the Dungeons and Dragons and even the larger tabletop role playing game community. So let's break down for people like what is this what is this this news story? Like what is the big news? It starts back in 2000. Dungeons and Dragons is kind of suffering. I believe that Hasbro has bought Wizards of the Coast, but Wizards of the Coast definitely owned Dungeons and Dragons in 2000. Yes. And basically what was happening is they were trying to figure out ways to instill confidence in their user base. And the way they did this is by releasing the open gaming license. The open gaming license is a basically a share alike copyright license that allows people to use certain parts of the Dungeons and Dragons intellectual property in their own works and make money off of the works that they creators make. So it was a very, the, the OGL the open game license was very uh, broad, gave a lot of power to creators um, and had in grants and considerations that this license was effective and in was effective in perpetuity. So the idea was like, and then they reiterated this in other facts and forums. The idea was that like, regardless of what happened to this license, you would be able to, if they wanted to update it or whatever, you'd be able to use any version of the license to create work. And that was supposed to be the big stopgap in between a Dungeons and Dragons adjusting the OGL in a way that was to too much of an overreach. So and just for comics folks, this this entire concept uh, that there's a company that like is is so different from how the comic space works because mm-hmm. like in comics, you know, if you want to to build anything off of the IP of, you know, Marvel or DC or whatever, like they're if it's in any way over the radar, like mm-hmm they're going to go after you. It's just that so many of the things um, are not worth pursuing, and so they don't. Whereas Mm -hmm. the original open gaming license that Wizards of the Coast did was really, is really a radical document in terms of like being something that acknowledged that it is 
good for the parent company that fans are making works, extrapolating and building and growing on the actual thing that the company makes. Like this Mm -hmm. is the first time that a company had said like, actually, we realize that what you're doing is helping to popularize what we're making and part of you and we're not going to sue you and you guys can go and like build your, you know, like make it even a company that is publishing um, modules that people can use as add-ons to play D&D, for example. Correct. Um, yeah, so, so, yeah. So the OGL um, is connected to a system reference document, which includes like some of the races and species and classes that are hallmarks of role-playing in Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, the system reference document is not only to outline exactly what people can use, but to also provide a very bare bones uh, role playing game where like you could take everything in the system reference document and play just about any kind of Dungeons and Dragons game. You don't get the full game, but you get enough of it that you get the gist. So this OGL 1.0, this systems reference document, which was created in 2000, um, was slightly tweaked over the years, which is why it's considered the, a 1.0a. And that doesn't really matter for the purposes of what's happening now. But for 23 years, Dungeons and Dragons and Wizards of the Coast have not touched, more or less, this document, which allowed fans to create for Dungeons and Dragons and make money. And also, like a lot of said, create companies like there's a there's paizo cobalt press mcdm all of these companies produce what's called third-party content for dungeons and dragons so you could buy a a book from cobalt press that's an adventure that you would run on top of dungeons and dragons so it's like a just an addition if that makes sense like another yeah. thing to play cool Okay, great. We're we're all on board. We're doing great. We're on top of it. <laughs> and then in late 2022, Dungeons and Dragons presented to high earning third party publishers a new edition of the open gaming license, which they are calling the open, which they said was the open gaming license 1.1. The new open gaming license which I'll just call the the updated OGL. The updated OGL was 10 times more restrictive, really created huge overreach on what Dungeons and Dragons would own from the the work of the third-party publishers. They were instituting a royalty system which had never been instituted before because in the old OGL there was a a clause that said that you could do anything that you wanted royalty free, which again was pretty revolutionary when it happened. This was doing away with that clause and instituting a tiered royalty system, essentially aiming at the publishers that had helped make Dungeons and Dragons so popular, such as Cobalt Press and Paizo. So that's the drama. That's like yeah. basically what happened. Um, and then all of this kind of started to fall apart for Dungeons and Dragons when I received a copy of the OGL 1.1 before they released it, before Dungeons and Dragons released it. You got the leak. You are the Woodward and or Bernstein, I suppose, <laughs> of, of this story. Um, That's very flattering. But uh, yeah, uh, essentially, that's that's a very interesting and easy way to think about it. Um, I got this leak and I read it and I was really surprised by what it held because it, it went back on a lot of what the OGL 1.0, the original OGL, was supposed to protect. And it, it was just very, pardon the pun, draconian. <laughs> in a lot of its terms and a lot of its a lot of the the ways that Dungeons and Dragons was clearly trying to control 
what people were doing and you know just like they were trying to like basically like take this the open sandbox like the open world that they had created and just trying to corral everybody into a walled garden Mm -hmm. and nobody liked it yeah I mean, so there's definitely you have the you had um, a royalty system that was tiered coming out. Mm-hmm. Um, what are some of the other big concerns that that people voiced? Well, the big cer- the big concern was who would own the copyright to the the third party work, mm-hmm. um, because there was language in this the updated OGL one point one that said that. Wizards of the Coast would own your would own the copyright to your work, and it was framed in language that's pretty boilerplate for people for like sites that are doing distribution and sites that are like reselling on your behalf. Mm-hmm. Um, but it raised a lot of red flags for a lot of creators because no matter what you would, no matter what you want to be able to own your copyright. And the fact is that Dungeons and Dragons was an acting as a go-between in between um, creators and the customer. They were acting as a barrier. And the fact that people would have to go through Dungeons and Dragons to get their stuff, maybe not approved, but they would have to submit their work to Dungeons and Dragons to like be recorded and to like be in a system and a database before it was it would be able to be given to the customer. A lot of people got their hackles up at that because there's really no telling what Dungeons & Dragons would have been able to do in between the points of like receiving that work and then the third-party creators being able to put it up for sale. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, and I, I also just like, I was really highlighting the, and this is the part that they, in their responses since then have been like, well, we didn't actually mean that was, um, Wizards will have a non-exclusive, non-exclusive, but perpetually revocable worldwide sub-license, royalty-free license to use that content for any purpose. Yes. Indie creators were like, so you're saying that you can just use it and charge other people for using our work? Yes. So that was another big part of it and definitely like uh, sort of filed under a lot of the copyright and ownership issues that people have. Um, Again, this is language that is not totally unreasonable and like it is boilerplate in a lot of instances but because it was such a massive massive change from the open gaming license 1.0 people read this and understandably were just like we don't want to be a part of this at all this is overreach to such a degree that like we are basically writing for you we're basically your employees writing for you rather than being independent creators writing for our customers Hmm, that's interesting. One thing that I thought was interesting was um, one of the people I was speaking to was like, well, this was a draft, this wasn't final, things could change a lot between now and when they were going to make it final. And then the point with there is like, well, it was leaked, which means that somebody wanted the public to see this and react to it so that there would be more public response taken into account in terms of the final results. Like, people responding to this to say what their concerns were is completely appropriate because that's like Mm -hmm. part of how you're going to get around to a better resolution to this thing in the first place. So like, even if you're, even if someone is a hundred percent convinced that like, well, this is just a draft that might not have stayed the same. It's like, okay, so it's a draft. And now the public got to weigh in on the draft. You're welcome. You know? (laughs) Right. Right. I think that like, I think it's very charitable to call this a draft. Mm. When I read it, the only things missing were, you know, in parentheticals, email here, link here. Uh, this was a very much a document that people, that they intended to release. That's, at least it is my opinion that this is a document that they intended to release. And it was pretty final. I have sources that say that this document had been around, they had been working on this document for years. I have sources that say that they this is the document that I received was the same document they received in late 2022 mm. with deal like sweetheart deals attached saying like if and so third party content creators got like sweetheart deals 
And Dungeons & Dragons said, if you sign this deal, you'll only have to pay 15% royalties instead of 25% royalties, and we'll give you some marketing. So yeah, the idea there was to like keep some of the larger, presumably larger, other things like mm-hmm. I'm just going to speculate so that you don't have to, sp- you know, sure. I will speculate. Just <laughs> okay, yeah. speculating. Yeah, go for it. Well, <laughs> say that something like Critical Role will get to have a more favorable royalty ratio because they did weigh in on it. And, you know, D&D is saying like, okay, we know you guys are also not crazy random like flakes. So we mm-hmm. have this like valid legal agreement with you you know, and that's, and and we have you on board and you guys speaking in advance saying, hey, this deal is legit. So like that sort of feels like the intent to me behind them having gone out to some of those partners early. Yeah, I think that that's definitely part of it. I think that, again, I heard rumors that they were intending to go live on January 4th. And I have multiple sources that say they were intending to go live January 4th with a list of third party partners who had already signed on to be a part of like the next stage of Dungeons Hmm. and Dragons, um, which would include the updated OGL 1.1. And when that didn't pan out, uh, for some reason they did not go live January 4th. I don't know for sure why, but I I sincerely suspect that a lot of people just did not sign those sweetheart deals. So they Hmm. didn't have the partners that they wanted. Mm Mm-hmm. And so they didn't go live January 4th and that's, and I received the document January 4th because people were like, oh, this was supposed to go out. It didn't. Something's going wrong. Time to, time to fuck them up. So let's talk some about the public response from both fans and also independent creators and small, sure. you know, the other companies that have made products that were built on the D&D system. Yeah. So I think that there's a couple different buckets of people who are affected by this. The first is the third party content creators like Paizo, MCDM, Green Ronin, Cobalt Press, who create third party products for Dungeons and Dragons. And they had presumably a couple of these people had seen the OGL 1.1. Some of them hadn't, which was pretty surprising. But once the report started coming out and the 1.1 started circulating elsewhere online, uh, companies started lining up and saying, we will not be signing any any document that looks anything like this. And because you even attempted to do so, <laughs> fuck you. Like Cobalt Press is doing their own system now. MCDM is doing their own system now. Everyone is sort of realizing that it's very risky to be in bed with Wizards of the Coast. Mm-hmm. So third-party publishers in particular have completely rejected almost in mass rejected the OGL 1.1 and are now in the process of extricating themselves from Dungeons and Dragons. So So I I just want to repeat for like folks in comic space, the open gaming license, the OGL as it was created in 2000 was really a unique and radical document that enabled the hobby to flourish and kept D and D vital during times in which the game was less popular than it is right now, um, the, and it helped build resilience and creativity and support in the community. And you know, I'm trying to imagine a world in which we had something like that for any of the other collectively written uh, mass narratives that folks love and enjoy. And I, you know, mm-hmm. I certainly that is never going to happen with anything from Marvel or DC. But mm-hmm. it does make you curious, or me curious what it would look like for some of the other worlds that are, you know, more independently owned, but still collectively created and generated to have looked at that model Mm -hmm. and adopted in some way, because that initial document, like one of the, you know, the reason people were so upset that it was changed was that the original document itself was really quite visionary. Um, And I think that there is, There's a problem where you still, you know, I think some of the entertainment industry companies are realizing the importance of fan works in supporting their stories and popularizing Mm -hmm. them. Um, But, you know, there are very few people who have any ability to formalize their creating of creative content in such a way that it is a sustainable career or or job for them in any other kind of space. Um, Right. Yeah. So... I'm jealous of the OGL original flavor. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's definitely one of those things that's uh, pretty incredible. So 
So the thing is that the OGL, the open gaming license, predates the Creative Commons license. Oh, wow. Yeah. So just to kind of, again, emphasize the the sort of revolutionary nature of saying you can use RAP royalty-free, license-free in perpetuity as long as this license stands is, I think it's important to note that the Creative Commons license was established in 2002. Hmm. And the OGL 1.0 was in 2000. Yeah, I mean, it really was, it really was, it continues to to be really radical. Um, And so, yeah, so you saw the businesses that were kind of built around the OGL's existence um, responding really critically and being like, we're not going to accept this and now looking at fleshing out more of their own systems. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And mm-hmm. then there's the other tier of people. Let's talk about them. <laughs> yeah. So so there's other there's basically two other tiers of people. There's the big third party publishers. There are content creators uh, and smaller presses, which I'm sort of putting in one group. And then there's just the average fan. So the content creators, a lot of them heard hints of the 1.1 because they're a lot of the content creators are so well connected in the industry that they are friends at Cobalt or MCDM or wherever. And they heard hints that like something was coming down the pipe from Dungeons and Dragons mm-hmm. about the, about the OGL. And in December of last year, December, 2022, uh, it, there was some leaks about an NDA being signed and Dungeons and Dragons sort of like, you know, giving out some something to some people no one no one like really came out and said what was going on we now know that they were giving out sweetheart deals and the ogl 1.1 um but content creators were sort of raising the red flag at that time so they were they were already ready and prepared to like pay attention to what Dungeons and Dragons was doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and because these content creators, like people who are making YouTubes or actual plays or, you know, doing like smaller third party content that was just like them and their friend putting something together and putting it on DMs Guild or Drive Through RPG, all of these people were already aware that something was happening. So while they may not have been preparing at the same level that third party publishers were preparing, There were thousands, thousands of people who knew something was up Hmm. and were just sort of waiting for something to break. Um, So that's that. And then as soon as the OGL 1.1 was leaked and my report came out, all these content creators were like, vindication! (laughs) (laughs) And immediately like jumped to the defense of the 1.0, the original OGL, and immediately jumped to the defense of my work, which I'm very grateful for, and immediately jumped to the defense of third-party publishing. So already there was like this sort of collective mobilization of people who saw what was happening in the OGL 1.1, realized that the 1.0 was being walked back, and said, fuck no. So some of the ways that was said were pretty consistent and, and growing some people mass on un, unsubscribe to um, the D beyond which is the online portal right so that leads to the third the third group of people which are fans who might not have any skin in the game but recognize the importance of content creators and third-party publishers and I think that the reason that even fans who, again, would not be necessarily be directly affected by the OGL 1.1 got so up in arms is because they realized the importance of the kind of symbiotic ecosystem that exists in the Dungeons and Dragons tabletop space. Because right now, so many people get into the game and then they love it. So they write their own thing for it. And then they're like, you know, why don't I write something that I can publish and make money on? So then they do that. And then someone else at a third party publisher reads that, that module that like someone who was just a fan three months ago created and taps them and is like, Hey, do you want to write for us? And then maybe in three years, Watsy taps them again and is like, Hey, why don't you write a module for us now? And mm-hmm. that, that's that's been happening for 
a decade, over a decade, where fans are becoming writers, are becoming authors, are becoming like Wizards of the Coast subsidy, like freelancers, right? So every single fan knows that this is happening and realizes that for the health of the like the hobby, restricting how third party publishers do their work will ultimately hurt everybody. And fans realize that it was their the people that they have parasocial relationships to, like, you know, Critical Role, Dimension 20, any number of content creators were going to be threatened by this OGL 1.1. And they're just like, what about my favorite stories? What about the storytellers I care about? What about the shows that I listen to every week? What about the things that bring me joy? And they all were jumping to their defense as well. And fans just really did the work to educate themselves on what was happening, figure out what was important, and speak with their subscriptions. And they, a lot of big name fans kind of helped push the D&D be gone hashtag on Twitter and fans, GMs, literally any anyone who heard about this and realized what Dungeons and Dragons was doing and thought it was bad, went to D&D Beyond, which is a website that is owned by Wizards of the Coast currently. Uh, that's like, you, there's character creator sheets. You can buy digital modules and reference them. It's I think kind it's of like an mostly how people, yeah, mostly if people are playing online, that is probably right. how they're, D&D specifically, that is probably how they're playing it. Totally. And I also know people who, you know, use D&D Beyond in just like analog games because it's easier to like buy an iPad and like purchase things on D&D Beyond and use that mm. as a reference than like carting around five <laughs> massive books, you know? I know. And I can't keep my sheets updated if they're on paper because I lose them. Because it's so, awful. Because you have to yeah. erase things and rewrite them, and then maybe you wrote it wrong, and then maybe you get a better weapon. It's just a disaster. So, putting everything on D and D Beyond was great. People love D and D Beyond, and everyone sort of in mass canceled their subscription to show Wizards of the Coast that they were not going to support Dungeons and Dragons or Wizards of the Coast if the restrictive OGL one point one was going to go forward and here's here's the thing that's just incredible of course this is like a pyramid of who's affected where it's like the itty the itty bitty part of the pyramid is the third party publishers slightly bigger as creators most people are fans the fans made such an impact that wizards of the coast was sent scrambling canceled a bunch of canceled a couple announcements and had to recalibrate because so many fans looked at this 1.1, saw that people were reacting to it online, agreed with the backlash, and then went to D&D Beyond and canceled their subscription. I heard that the cancellation page was so slammed that people couldn't even go through it. Yeah. And I think Paizo's website went down because I was trying to check something there, and I think their site went down (laughs) so many traffic people checking out Paizo. Yeah, so I, I'm not sure about the Paizo one. I know that it happened later on for another in- incident. But Dungeons & Dragons Beyond, their servers were so overloaded that things just shut down. People were getting 500 errors. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's just pretty incredible because uh, there's there's a couple statistics out there that I don't have right now that say, like, most people don't spend a lot of money on Dungeons & Dragons. And it's mostly game masters and DMs. Mm-hmm. That spent a lot of money on these actual books and on Dungeons and Dragons Beyond. So the fact that the, another like weird subset of a subset of a subset of people were so impactful that they like broke the website of like a Wizards of the Coast website. And who are owned by Hasbro, ladies and gentlemen. Who are owned by Hasbro. <laughs> yeah. And this this site was like built by fandom, like the the company fandom. Like it's a it's a solid site. They do like massive wikis. Like they knew the book. They know what they're doing. But they broke a site, and they forced Dungeons and Dragons to like recalibrate in hours. I believe you reported that they had five digits worth of complaint tickets in the system. 
five digits early this week. So that was wow. before before they canceled. So like, yeah, five digits early this week. So like before they canceled their announcement and before another leaked document came out that was like even more like patronizing than the OGL 1.1. Um, yeah, people, uh, if you had given them pitchforks, they would have rioted. It was so intense. And I highlight this number to people because, you know, in comics, there's frequently a situation where, like, for example, the person who pretended to be Japanese is one of the managing editors at Marvel, yet still to this day, and there's still harassers and abusers employed in various places, and people will say, well, I'm going to stop buying Marvel or I'm going to stop buying DC because of this particular practice. And the problem is, like, people don't organize that kind of work at scale that Marvel or DC, who are owned by some of the biggest companies in the world, are actually going to notice. Now, I, I, I'm, I don't really off the top of my head know how much, how the, the size of Hasbro versus like Disney, but I'm pretty sure Disney's bigger. Mm-hmm. Like when people are thinking about doing the whole consumer activism, you know, putting your dollars where your values are kind of a thing when it comes to unsubscribing from things, mm-hmm. um, the scale that you need to build for that to be impactful in that way is pretty significant. And so to put that into your calculations when you're thinking thinking about the organizing that has to happen for things to be at scale. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, you know, this this community, you know, one is like looking at pressuring a target that isn't quite as big, but two, like had a lot of people who were, you know, certainly reprimed into that conversation and had all these s- business spin-offs. Mm-hmm. Um that are that only exist because there was an OGL, but like because right. of them, there, there's sort of some more infrastructure almost built into the community. There um, is, and I think that there's a lot of that that comes from the fact that people were got really interested in role playing games and tabletop role playing games uh, over the past just even the three three to four years that the pandemic has been going on, um, because people started really trying to figure out online options for in-person games Mm -hmm. so that that really helped build the the infrastructure um and then it's the fact that people have been realizing that the only way to build a fandom around dungeons and dragons and the dungeons and dragons community is by finding the people that they really love and following them because they don't a lot of these people that they love, like Critical Role, is just sort of the easiest example. Sure, uh, <laughs> they they're not tradition they're not traditionally published or traditionally, uh, you know, generated outlet. They are they are at this point, but for a long time they were just like a bunch of friends like putting stuff on YouTube, you know, and, <laughs> and like people had to figure out ways to interact with with the fandoms that they wanted to interact with and a lot of that was online and through like these kind of networks that built up on Twitter and on Reddit um and on Discord so it it really was fairly easy for people to light the beacons there is an oh, hashtag open dnd petition um mm-hmm. that created it looks like they they're reporting they had 60,000 signatures um, what do you know about the folks who created that and how that got spread and disseminated the petition? Uh, I really don't know much about it. I know that it began in, again, November, December of 2022, when people were getting hints of mm. stuff happening. Got it. Uh, I know that it's the the crux of it is that they don't want the open gaming license to change. Uh, but I don't, I haven't paid a lot of attention to the details because I think the thrust of it is that like, they don't want anything to change or if they, if change is to happen, it should happen at a gradual scale where the the community can give feedback much like they're doing for the new edition of one D and D. Got it. But it's interesting that that was building at that scale prior to the news actually coming out. Cause I was just so amazed at how many signatures they had. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, like I said, this this sort of goes back to the fact that like creators, not third party publishers necessarily, but definitely like independent and smaller creators were raising the red flag pretty early on these issues and caused people to pay like me to pay attention, to pay more attention 
to what was actually happening and to sort of dig in a little bit and see if I could find anything out for myself, um, which uh, yielded gains. Right, right, totally. No, I think there's so many lessons in this for um, people in other areas of fandom and comic space to to really look at. I mean, I think the existence of the OGL, original OGL, you know, mm-hmm. should really be inspiring to people to think about as a thing that like shows what is possible. Do, do, can you talk a little bit about how that came to be? Although I guess we should probably also talk about the latest news in the story, but, but can you talk a little bit about how the OGL came to be? Yeah. So I'm not, I'll fully admit that I'm not totally up on the history of the OGL 1.0 uh, because for a lot of my reporting, I was just like, okay, I just need to figure out like what's changed and why it sucks. <laughs> um, but basically wizards wanted to, give power to the fans and make fans feel like they could be safe when creating work. And that was the purpose of the OGL was to find a way for fans to create and, you know, build, build the world that Dungeons and Dragons had. Yeah. I mean, established. I I think that some of the staff at wizards at Mm -hmm. the time were really pushing to be able to offer it. I know one of the founders of Paizo actually was there and was like, yes. trying to to get it to happen. Um, yeah. So the people, so like Monty Cook of Monty Cook Games, his name's on the original OGL. If you open up the OGL, you can sort of see the authors of it. So it's people like Jeremy Crawford, Chris Perkins, Rodney Thompson, Peter Lee, James Wyatt, Robert Schwab, Bruce Cordell, Chris Sims, Steve Townsend, based on original material by Gygax and Arneson. Um, and this is again, this is the one from 2016. But again, the the SR the the OGL 1.0 has been like tweaked, but it's never been revamped. So mm-hmm. the one that I just read was from 2016. Wait, but, wait, yeah, wait. the mm-hmm. the original open gaming license was always done with the intention to protect fans and give fans power. That's that's always been the intention in the history and. Ryan Dancy, uh, who was one of the original writers and creators of the OGL 1.0 in 2000, has been on record multiple times saying as much. So now Wizards is officially back to the drawing board, so they say, uh, as a response from from fans based around reporting like yours. <laughs> what, is, what is the current status of things? It's been a wild week. For Wizards of the Coast. So Wizards of the Coast, they were originally supposed to release the the new OGL on January 4th. And then they were, and then I released my report on the 5th. Then on Wednesday, January 11th, there were rumors and I heard confirmations from my sources that there was supposed to be an announcement, which they canceled. Uh, And then I heard from sources that there was supposed to be an announcement on the 12th. Um, which is when I received a OGL 2.0 FAC document and reported on it. And then it was canceled because someone leaked that document. Uh, I I was just writing up my report and I was like ready to go as soon as they lifted this announcement. Nothing happened. Uh, and then it was leaked and everyone freaked out again because they really didn't change the 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 big important stuff that people were concerned about. And then on Friday the 13th, they finally released an announcement in the morning, uh, basically capitulating, saying that they were sorry that they had rolled a natural one and that they had they were not going forward with an updated OGL at this point, um, but they would in the future and that they were listening to fans. So, in the space of, like, just one week, Wizards of the Coast had to backtrack, scramble, and then put everything on ice. Yeah, yeah. And there's been so many pieces of news and response from some of the other companies that, there were this, that were sort of, like, the larger companies that were building and selling works based on the D&D game um mm-hmm. we have heard for example uh paizo had 
done a release talking about creating something called an ORC license. Can you talk about that? Yes. So on Thursday, the 12th, uh, Paizo, who had not said anything for a week at all, uh, and even when I when I asked for a comment, they were like, it's complicated and we're not ready to give a comment. I was like, great. Let me know when you are. Right, right. Oh, and just one um, more time for our listeners. Paizo is a small is I mean it's a, it's one of the larger of the small companies right. that sells games based off of the initial D and D infrastructure. It was basically designed to make the game easier, I think, for certain kinds of players. Um, I have. I mean, I don't know. I, I feel like that was sort of what people were like saying they were going for when they made it, but I don't know. I I don't really remember it feeling that different the one time I played it to be honest yes I would I would tend to agree with that I think it's definitely like a different flavor but same vibe yeah um so so Paizo uh declined to comment for a week and then on Thursday the 12th Paizo who describes themselves as a mid-size publisher uh so Mm -hmm. so slightly bigger than the small publisher but definitely like nowhere near the level of Dungeons and Dragons Paizo came out on the, on Thursday the 12th with the plan for the open RPG creative license, which they call the ORC, which I think is adorable. <laughs> so the ORC license will be a another gaming license, much like the original OGL, much like the Creative Commons license, that will allow companies to submit system reference documents to a hopefully in the future a nonprofit entity mm-hmm. that will be the steward of the open rpg creative license so paizo is uh supporting the the development of the orc financially but they will not own it um again they're trying they're looking at the linux foundation and trying to emulate that S- in a way that like creates a, an open system for people to to play with, and they have gotten a decent number of people who are making their own systems to sign up to be a part of the Open RPG Creative License hmm. um, as part of both its development and its stewardship in the future. So yeah, it sounded like they were saying initially it was going to be housed at a law firm that is one of the people who worked on the original OGL um, created. Yeah, that's is, correct. Yeah. So um, I I forget the name of the the exact the gentleman Azores who it was, wife, but it was yeah. a yes, it was Azora Law that will be developing the orc and will be acting as its steward until the they can. Fun- funnel it into a nonprofit. That is the current intention. It'll be interesting to think about what the nonprofit's board and structure will be like. Um, you know, I, I've been, fr- if you're listening to this and you have any information or knowledge of the worker organizing campaign at the Paizo, at Paizo, um, because uh, there were a lot of workers who were talking about really bigoted and, and terrible workplace situation working at Paizo. And so they unionized and Paizo recognized the union. So now we have a unionized like tabletop RPG company, which is freaking awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, But it it goes to show that like there can be really toxic, bad management practices at any place. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to be important to see who's going to be the board and what the government structure is going to be of the nonprofit that would hold the license and what that process looks like. um, Because it's not like you want to just say, Hey, Paizo, you be in charge of this Mm -hmm. now. Like you're the good guy suddenly. It's like, it's much more complicated than that, you know? Um, but I think yes. the idea of having something that's going to be held by a nonprofit, if we can put in good governance stuff and have it be worker and creator led, I think is really a huge, amazing, inspiring potential. Yeah. I think it's, it's good to know that there is like a history of iffiness with, with Paizo in general. But I, I think it's important to also recognize that. They are the biggest role playing game after Dungeons and Dragons. That puts them in a position where they can lead the charge on something like this and get the support that a nonprofit will need in order to succeed. 
Yeah, because it's it's a lot of work and it's potentially mm-hmm. a lot of uncompensated work. Right. So there's there is um I don't know much about the the efforts that Paizo unionized. I don't know much about the efforts that or the the accusations coming out of Paizo just because I think that was like slightly before my tenure at io9 so i wasn't Mm -hmm. covering games um but i think that it's very clear that they're at at the very least if we want to give them like the most charitable interpretation possible um which i'm kind of willing to do uh it seems like they're trying to be leaders but not dictators about this Right. Um, we'll see what happens. Obviously, like anything can change, but the fact that they they have said multiple times that they will not own this license, and they never will. Uh, if we take that at face value, uh, I find it very reassuring. I think it, it reminds folks that if this is something that you feel passionately about, like now is a good time to get involved in it in a meaningful way because it is mm-hmm. a lot of work. Um, yep. What are your thoughts about what the fan response means for like the less, like does anything here like impact the people who are not part of the active fandom communities who are just like the children who show up, God willing, wearing a freaking mask at my local Mm -hmm. game store once a week for a game where there's a staff person at the shop who's like leading a RP, you know, who's leading D and D for a group of like 11 year olds. Like what does any of this meter look like for that kind of player? Um, look, for for the average player, this might not change very much, especially if they're not using Dungeons and Dragons Beyond. Mm-hmm. Um, it might mean that the DM might decide that they don't want to invest their time and energy in 5e anymore, and it might mean that they try other games. Uh, yeah. It might mean that, yeah, I mean, like it's one of those things where it's really hard to determine what an average, like, an average it's fan early is too. Awesome. Yeah. But yeah. I'm just fascinated by all the people who probably don't know any of this is going on and like what that looks like. Cause there's a, yeah. there's a, you know, there's like, it's a very split thing. Like there's a very offline re- fans and then there's a very much like all, part of the active community who are, you know, aware right. of it and not playing in such an atomized, separated way. Um, I mean, I'm wondering, like, do you think that, um, Oh, I should, I'll, I'll just ask you this question from sure. Mike Kelly, who is the host of One Shot Test Kitchen podcast, which is a really great RPG podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, he asks, uh, do you think other systems may look into adopting parts of the D&D OGL, or do you think that the D&D is un- in a unique position to enact something like that? I don't see anyone looking at the D&D OGL and thinking it's a safe bet. Because if, if D&D is willing to even put forth, even like draft up this kind of document, it means that the document isn't safe. Mm -hmm. So I think I I was talking with one of the chief operating executives. I I don't know. I forget his exact title at Monty Cook Games. And he said that like a savvy, a savvy creator might look at this and might, start to re-examine where Dungeons and Dragons is in the landscape. Mm-hmm. It might start to re-examine where 5e and 5th edition is in the life cycle of the RPG. So like, but like, so this means that, but do you think that a lot of, do you think a lot of games are going to sign on to the ORC, the new open, um, that what the, that sort of Paizo was talking about in your story mm-hmm. with them? Um, that like other games that maybe not aren't as popular or new systems that are not as popular would see the benefit to them of adopting an actual open license. Um, yeah. So I think, I think it depends on the size of the, of the publisher. I think anyone that's like mid to a small size publisher that like wants to protect their system and their IP will probably go for something like the orc. Um, I know that there are a lot of people who uh, want Creative Commons to be the more adopted system, but a lot of those people are like very, very small indie creators, like, you know, uh, studios that are literally like one or two people at most. Right. Um, well, what do you think it means for something like Evil Hat? Like, mm. do, I mean, I could see some companies deciding that they just want to have a very traditional um, 
a traditional IP situation where mm-hmm. like nobody can touch it or use it and you can just play the game and they keep all of the stuff built around it. Like I could see some companies deciding that that's the route they want to go. So White Wolf for a long time has been very protective of its of its IP. Um, mm-hmm. White Wolf is a publisher that publishes most, fam- most famously Vampire the Masquerade. Mm-hmm. Um, so they don't have... that. Their open gaming license is different um i don't have it right in front of me but i know for a fact that it is uh more restrictive and very much more careful in protecting what it owns um so there are instances of like these mid to smaller size publishers keeping some of that for themselves um i think that some for someone like eagle hat it will depend on the book that they're publishing um, because Evil Hat publishes books that are both made in house and publishes books from independent creators. For example, uh, Thirsty Sword Lesbians is not necessarily was not necessarily made by an Evil Hat creator. Yeah, it was a privately funded Kickstarter that got a lot of attention, and then the Kickstarter, I believe, found was uh, Evil Hat a very helpful partner in producing and, and distributing that. Yeah, so. I think for for a lot of these companies, for, for someone like Evil Hat that does kind of a little bit of everything, they might not wholesale sign on to the orc because I don't think that they, they're creating their own systems. I think that maybe, you know, John Harper, Bla- who does Blaze in the Dark, and I believe he did Aegon, he, like, someone like him might consider that, but I believe that uh, Blades in the Dark has its own like system for gaming that you can do a, a forged mm-hmm. in the dark license. So, so it you depends. Could build, you could build it. You could, you could build your own game based on the mechanics of blades in the dark, for example. Yeah. Yeah. You can, you absolutely can. And, um, and, and you could charge people for it or it just has yes. to just be independent. Interesting. It, you can charge people for it. Yeah. So that's kind of the thing. The open gaming license really inspired a lot of people who are making their own games to attach their own, licenses to their own individual systems um another great example of this is the powered by the apocalypse system the best which yeah which i really really love that has its own license is the powered by the apocalypse design framework which was originally developed by megway baker and vincent baker for the game apocalypse world so this has a a very very open license that allows people to basically use the framework without without any royalties attached to the power by the apocalypse design system. Um, Baker the Bakers have never asked for royalties. They have they have asked like if you make a significant amount of money, if you want to toss us a thousand dollars, we would really appreciate it. But that's the most that they have ever asked for hmm. the power by the apocalypse system that they developed. That's interesting. I, for example, like I find the power by apocalypse system to be a system that is better for the way I like to role play games, which mm-hmm. involves having as much acting as possible and as little math as possible. Right. Um, but I've literally have no idea what the powered by apocalypse setting is. I've never played anything in that setting. I've only played it in completely different settings and in fact, settings built on top of those settings, like the Monster of the Week one, which is kind of a Buffy the Vampire Slayer mm-hmm. type equivalent, is a, a world that is built on, powered by the Apocalypse's uh, game engine, as it were. But the way my friends and I played it, we had it all set in the Victorian era. Um, right. <laughs> so like, I, you know, what are the equivalents for those? Like, this is really yeah. a way of playing things that are really rooted in creativity. I mean... Mm-hmm. One thing I can say is that, like, I also, you know, I am curious about if you're a game, if you're somebody who's creating a new game and a new system, like, and you're independent and you're kind of like, you know, I can see there being plenty of legitimate reasons for someone to not want to have an open license on their game. But if you're looking at having something which is big and spread and growing, Mm -hmm. then building a world that's on a set of rules that other people are already familiar with is going mm-hmm. to make it easier for people to take it up. Um, because once you know how to play the rules for one thing, you can play them for another. Mm-hmm. But then also it makes it easier for you to distribute it. Um, mm-hmm. 
But then if you're somebody whose primary interest in building a new game is like you have new ideas for how rules and structure and things like that should work, mm-hmm. then instead you might want to be someone who is creating your own um, your own game and your own license. And because, um, you know, this is the thing, though, like they're not all has owned by Hasbro. You know, most publishers are not owned by Hasbro. And right. um, it's a, you know, it's a struggle to, uh, you know, even during this explosion of love of gaming, it's still a struggle to like keep it up and, you know, so yeah, it's a complex absolutely. issue. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's one of those things where a lot of people will evangelize for a certain license or a certain like openness of a license, but there's, there's a lot of things to consider um, when developing a game and a lot of things to think about that may or may not, I wouldn't say obvious because a lot of people like think about these things really hard, but <laughs> there are a lot of things to consider. Um, I, one of the, one of the reasons not to allow a creative commons license and instead go a more custom route, like the OGL or the orc is to prevent bad actors in the community mm-hmm. because if you have someone making blatantly bigoted, homophobic, racist games using your system, and your system is a is a Creative Commons license, you have no recourse. You yeah, know? that was one of the exci- one of the things that I saw in the new in the proposed version of the changes to the OGL that I think is is really worth talking about is they say that. Um, that Dungeons and Dragons would have the right to say that if you were making works that were bigoted, and in, they specifically mentioned even transphobic, like they went into the details mm-hmm. of the kinds of bigotry that are not permitted, that they right. said that you can't put it out on their system if it's bigoted material. Do you have yes. thoughts about how that kind of clause might look in the future when now that it's back to the drawing board? Yeah, I I think that they they realized that that was those two things which were like no big in material and no NFTs were the two things that people were like okay like we understand this and we get it. Um, I think that you don't need the massive overhaul to the OGL in order to do stuff like that. Mm. Um, I think that you could have done like an update with like another writer that that does that. But I think that another big problem that that presents is moderation and yeah. like who's who's going to be determining that um because you know wizard of the coast literally last year published the the hodozi which was a very uh racist depiction of a certain species of like space monkeys mm. that were like previously enslaved but loved it oh god yeah. Who's writing was, this? What's her name? She who shall not be named. <laughs> it was it was just like it was really uh the caricatures were very, very clear. Oh so God. it's one of those things where even people who weren't really tuned in or interested in pointing out racism realized how poorly this was worded. So it's mm. one of those things where do we trust these big companies? To be able to moderate this sort of thing effectively, if they if they don't even recognize bigotry in their own in their own work, yeah, yeah. So that was another big concern. I'm sure that's going to be a concern for the orc as well. But it is good that people are pointing it out and thinking about it and being like, so who's going to determine what's bad? Because it's yeah, you know, why they seem to not know is the thing. Like it. They seem to right. they, they seem to want things to not be racist or bigoted, but not necessarily be successfully capable of identifying that. Correct, um, and that's and that's another reason why pe- a lot of people are like, well, the Creative Commons allows for everyone to make their own mistakes and be judged. And I'm just mm-hmm. like, fair, mm-hmm. but how how much like do we want that out there anyway? So yeah. there's there's pros, there's pluses and minuses and pros and cons to all of it, and it's incredibly complicated it must be like done on a on a on an individual company basis to determine how they want to license out their systems and how much of their ip they want to retain for something like toys or movies because i just don't know how much protection something like the ogl or the orc or the creative commons gives if someone wanted to make 
a Pathfinder movie. I don't know if that's allowed or not, or yeah. is under the or like who it's knows? Very, yeah. like it's very clear with the um orange from the open gaming license. Mm-hmm. And you know, the thing that I keep thinking is like it's completely reasonable to say, like, you guys can't make a movie where the main character is a beholder monster, which D- Wizards of the Coast, which TSR, I should say, the original creators of D&D, clearly created. It's a unique thing to them. Mm-hmm. But, like, you know, you, I, I'll put it this way. I'm a big metalhead. And we all remember when Gene Simmons attempted to copyright making the sign of devil horns, which, one, is a traditional hands gesture dating back time in memoriam. Uh, to like Italy where right. he's not from and he was not even the first person to popularize it in heavy metal that was Ronnie James Dio of course who is Italian American um mm. so like i i don't think we've seen D- Dungeons and Dragons trying to sue people who are telling stories in which there are paladins or clerics like it seems like they understand they have hobbits that they don't hobbits. call hobbits like they yeah. don't seem to have the same level of going out of their way to claim things that really clearly aren't theirs are theirs. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think the fact that they had that history of not pretending that they invented fantasy um, yeah. is one of the reasons why people felt comfortable building on the game in the first place, too, is they yeah. hadn't been litigious, really. They hadn't been litigious, and they were also very uh, derivative. You know, mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. Lord of the Rings, it's Dragon Riders of Pern, it's all of these things, and it's everything else, and it's none of them. Mm-hmm. So it's one of those things where Dungeons and Dragons is so popular because it is so easy to understand what it is doing and the stories it is telling. Yeah. Regardless of whether or not it's actually like easy to play or easy to learn doesn't matter (laughs) yeah mechanically doesn't matter i will fully admit that i still ask my dm like do i roll with dexterity for initiative or and my dm is just like linda no i mean it's i i have been playing yeah yeah my 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 poor dm they're just like linda you've been playing D for 10 years and i'm like i don't fucking know the rules yeah yeah i have to say no rules Mm -hmm. no there's certain classes that i won't play because i don't understand how they work um but like I would just say, I mean, I, this is one of the questions I wanted to, to bring up later. Also, was just sort of like, yeah, you know, I, I always tell people like, in, unless there's some specific reason that you really want to play D and D yourself, like, don't start mm-hmm. with D and D. It is not a very user, it is not a user friendly game. If you are yes. someone who has a hard time keeping track of like little detailed things, numbers and rules, like it wasn't. Of course, the first game of its type, it was not the best designed game. They were inventing the wheel, sort of. I mean, it's based on military mm-hmm. games that people used to do before. Yeah, but let me tell game. you, those military games that predate D&D are things that I cannot conceive of any human being finding fun. I hate to say it. I put it out there. <laughs> this was like the first game that actually sounded fun that like people came up with. Um, so, but it has, you know, as a result, it doesn't have the best, most welcoming design. And I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of other things are, as have grown. Like, who do you think are some of the games for, for people who this whole thing have kind of turned them off of thinking about engaging in D&D? Mm. Like, what are some alternatives that you think are particularly enticing, especially for new players? Okay. So, I think I think it's really hard to answer this question mm-hmm. um, because whenever anyone asks, like, well, what do I play other than D&D? I always ask, what kind of story do you want to tell? Yeah. Um, and if the if the answer is like, oh, I want straight up and down swords and sorcery. Uh, I'm always like, well, there's always Pathfinder, which isn't necessarily like any easier than Dungeons and Dragons, but it's certainly there. Um, I think that Iron Sworn is pretty good. Again, this is again straight up and down swords and sorcery. Mm-hmm. Um, Iron Sworn is pretty good. Uh, Free League puts out a uh, Year Zero engine based work. So if you learn the Free League Year Zero engine, you can basically play any of their games, which is pretty nice. Um, but they have a game called Vasen which is kind of like horror folklore role playing, which I really, Mm. I've really enjoyed reading. Um, And they are actually coming out with kind of in the same vein as Dungeons Dragons, a a game called Dragon Bane, which is a a reprint of one of their original games from like 40 years ago. So if you learn the year zero engine, 
you can you can pick up Dragon Vein pretty quickly. I would also recommend uh, Morkborg, M O R K B O R G, for just kind of straight up and down horror fantasy. Mm. Um, it's like dark horror fantasy. There's also uh, the Zweihander RPG, which is described as dark fantasy. Um, so there's a lot of things out there that are like you if you still want to like be tactical and be be able to like aggressively min max your character and if you if you enjoy that kind of gaming those are the games that i would recommend hmm. um some of my favorite games uh you don't roll dice yeah <laughs> some of my favorite games you have like tarot cards or you have tokens um the belonging outside of belonging system uses tokens as a currency to enact narrative power in any scene. Um, I happen to really, really like the Powered by the Apocalypse system, which we mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. And some of the games that I really like are Monster of the Week, mm -hmm. which is a like X-Files game. Um, I really like the power by the apocalypse system because it's very driven by like what you intend to do. It's really character driven. Like there are Correct. so many times in D and D where you make a role and the code, the role doesn't work. And mm -hmm. unless your DM is really adept and many of them are, but like lots of them aren't like it's, there's sometimes where something would fail where it, it's completely out of character for it to fail. And then you're like, well, what is this doing with my characters? It doesn't make sense. With like right. powered by the apocalypse, um, you, it, it, it sort of has built in that the outcomes even though chance is a factor, are more closely mm -hmm. related to what makes sense for your character individually. Right. Yeah. The difference, the big difference is that like if you fail a roll in Dungeons and Dragons, like let's say that like you roll a D20 and you get a five and you needed a 10 to succeed, nothing happens. You just fail. However, in something like Powered by the Apocalypse, if you roll ever, something will happen. Yeah. And you fail um, interestingly. It, you fail fun. And it's and, and you fail in ways that are like related to your character. Like it just seems mm -hmm. so much more driven by character than math. Absolutely. Mm. Oh, another one. So a really, a really solid system is the trophy RPG system. Hmm, I don't know this. It's lightweight, dark fantasy. It's kind of the game. It's not very well suited for longer campaigns. Um, however, so like the ideal trophy game is something around like two to three sessions because you are playing to lose. Hmm. You are basically running your character into the ground and you know it. Um, but the trophy RPG system is really good. It has a ton of third party content. It's really easy to learn and it's suited towards the, the dark fantasy vibe for sure. Um, and I still tell people like, if you're looking for, it's one and done, although the one can be lengthy, um, that I think really is clear for people who want less, there are dice involved, but um, less math and more, and, and and like more easy to explain rules. Like I love Fiasco, which is basically yes. a build your own Coen Brothers movie uh, yes. RPG game. And they can be grafted into ways that are more fantasy related, certainly, but it's mm -hmm. not, it's not, the bones of it are not towards anything super genre other than the genre of, you know, things are going haywire and, and breaking. Everything going crazy. Yeah. It, it yeah. lends itself to humor and satire and social satire. Um, yes. But I find the rules to be very approachable for people who have a hard time with rules, which I do because I just don't retain that information. Yeah. I bully pulpit games is is really fun. They they always put out really cool stuff. So that's that's a lot of my my recommendations for like yes, if you are you. trying <laughs> to do up and down, you know, swords and sorcery fantasy. Uh, the the only thing that I really I really really want to plug is a science fiction role playing game that is out of print, but you can buy it. You can get it for you can get like the PDF for free on Drive Through RPG. Um, it's called Hearts Blazing. I've and it's heard basically, of this. it's one of my favorite games. It's basically uses cards to help you create a multi episode season of like a sci fi show. So it's inspired by stuff like Battlestar Galactica mm. and Firefly and Stargate. 
et cetera, et cetera. And it is just so much fun and really relies on the fact that everybody knows what goes into a science fiction television show and gives you all of the tropes that you might want to include in your game and gives those to you as like narrative power tokens basically um where you like have a a deck of cards that are associated with like the archetype of the character that you're playing like a veteran or an engineer or an ace and you have all of these archetypes and these tropes that happen to this kind of character throughout the course of a season and you play these cards on episodes so one episode is like filled with like certain tropes and another episode is filled with other tropes and it's just so much fun it's so much fun I I love this game so much. Like I treasure the physical copy that I have because I know that like I will never be able to find it again. What makes it go out of print? Like is it just not getting picked up by enough people or it's just, you know, it's a small publisher and they just stop making they just don't exist anymore. They stop making games. But like you it's surprised that you can't but I'm surprised that there isn't a way to get a PDF while giving some money to the people who who uh created it. I mean, they're just not making games anymore, or they're not making games under this uh, banner. It's I think it was like a really small, like two or three person team, hmm. and it's just that's that's kind of the way it goes. A lot of these indie studios make amazing games, like genuinely. Hearts Blazing is one of my favorite games. It's one of my like friend group's favorite games, and it's just made by this amazing little studio. And you can't, you just can't get it anymore. It's a difficult business. And it's important for people like our listeners to remember to financially support the small and independent games that you love so that they can continue to exist, right? Yeah. One of the things that uh, I do is I curate the gaming shelf on io9, which is a twice monthly column that's basically just dedicated to new and crowdfunding independent tabletop role-playing games. So tune into that oh that's super cool do you think there's any important lessons that like people who are in comics or like other nerd spaces should be taking away from all of this it's really hard to find find the lessons here just because tabletop role-playing games rely so much on a reciprocal symbiotic relationship in a way that a lot of other media doesn't necessarily need to have um, a lot of other media are like, well, it'll find its audience eventually, but Dungeons and Dragons is very much like we will create the audience ourselves in interesting ways. Like the community is like, we will create the audience ourselves and we will be the audience. Um, so it feels slightly different. What's so crazy is that there's so many cases in comics where it's clear that fan work is behind something becoming successful, but it is just yes. not acknowledged. It is just not right. acknowledged by the company. Um, and so the fact that like D&D entered this from a position of realizing that, especially during the lean years, how much they depended mm-hmm. on fandom is a very different position than comics who, even though the comics themselves are go- maybe going through lean years, are in denial about the role that mm-hmm. fandom plays in keeping certain things alight and through fan works. Um, I mean, that's, yes. you know, to be said, like the companies could be even more litigious than they are. Like, you yeah. know, it, when you have an artist making a pinup of, you know, of Marvel characters and selling them at a con, Marvel doesn't go and like to try to get them arrested. That's something right. they could actually be doing that they don't. But absolutely, you know, yeah. I mean, they they know that like, if they started doing stupid shit like that, they would get, they would get hurt because because the artists that work for them they don't pay them enough for them to get by so the artists who they should be employing uh are like making these other works to get by and so they don't want to sue them so that they so they're 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 supplementing their Mm -hmm. income in ways that aren't costing the company any money Um, right so that's that's kind of an interesting parallel to to talk about because wizard of the coast is and has been for a very long time the greatest source of income for artists who are making fan who are doing fantasy drawings like they are the company that commissions the most fantasy artists Hmm. in the world so that's that's just something interesting to 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 know that's interesting and people were just now talking about payment rates for them and for paizo on twitter it's it's not great 
I mean, third third party publishers have traditionally, at least in the past five years. So yeah, at least in the past five years, it's pretty well known that third party publishers pay better than larger publishers. That's really wild. Yes, it is really wild. <laughs> um, things things are things are weird. I'm still I'm still trying to think of lessons because I'm very involved in fandom. I love fan fiction and being a part of that kind of community of creators and fans. I think find networks, find journalists who are willing to like take concerns seriously and who aren't. A lot of journalists and. I'll include myself in this, definitely rely on large companies, large media companies being nice enough to me mm. to like give me exclusives or like get me interviews with people. And there's definitely a part of me that's like, D&D might hate me now. And yeah. that's, dude, that's just going to happen. That's the price I pay for doing a journalism. Um, yeah. but, but, you know, I can't do that with every company. You know, I or if I could, uh, I don't know if I would be able to. Um, I'd certainly want to, but it's one of those things where, like, I still in order to be an entertainment journalist, I still need access. Uh, And I think that a lot of people might not be willing to risk losing access Mm -hmm. for for some for for any number of reasons. And that's one of the reasons this podcast exists. There have been multiple Mm -hmm. times where I was able to cover stories that I know that if I was relying on the big two publishers to give me access in order for me to do articles that people were paying me to do, I wouldn't have been able to do because they're angry at me. Now, this is my hobby. Um, It's Mm -hmm. fucked up that the only reason that I'm able to do you know, be critical of them and like do things like report about the time that, you know, it's all very complicated with me that Peter Allen David like went on an anti-Romani rant at Comic-Con. You know, I then got like Marvel basically banning me from having access to any of their creators. Like, so, right. Like if I had to do this work for a living, I wouldn't have been able to report that, which is just horrifying, but I'm a hobbyist. So it doesn't matter, but people shouldn't have to be a hobbyist in order to like report and tell hard stories. It's fucked up. Yeah, so a lot of this stuff will depend on what D&D decides to do. I personally don't think that D&D is going to care. Is I think they care, but I don't think that they're going to like take it out on me personally. Uh, I would be surprised. We shall see. Well, we shall see. You- <laughs> well, again, I want to yeah. thank you for, for your amazing work. Um, is there anything we haven't <laughs> yeah. covered that you think we should do before we go? Um. Gosh, no, I I really do want to say that if you're interested in indie RPGs, that's mostly what I care about and what I do. So if you care about indie, indie RPGs, I hope you follow my work and um, I hope you support small creators and I hope that you play fun new games with your friends. Oh, we hope that too. So where can our listeners keep up with your amazing journalism? Tell us where they can find you online. So the easiest way to find me online is... Uh, on my Twitter, which is at Lynn Codega, L-I-N-C-O-D-E-G-A. I write for io9, which is a vertical of Gizmodo. And you can see my whole author page on, Giz- on Gizmodo, uh, gizmodo.com backslash author backslash L Codega. As for us, Graphic Policy Radio, we are on every platform that has podcasts. If you end up not finding us on a platform where you listen to podcasts, tell me and we'll figure out what's up with that RSS feed. We'll be having more coverage coming out of comics of my Star Trek side quest podcast with Sarah Rasher. Very <laughs> soon, I'm going to be guesting on, oh gosh, oh golly, oh wow. It's an Excalibur podcast to talk about Excalibur, you know, the X-Men sort of spinoff series. Really excited to be guesting on that. I uh, want you to check that out. And for now, I am, I'm still on Twitter a lot. I'm trying to go to Mastodon more, but it's just not where things are on my phone. It's E-L-A-N-A underscore Brooklyn on all of the social media platforms that I want you to engage with me on. Um, and as we like to say, keep it geeky.
Hey, thanks for watching the previous video from Graphic Policy Television. Just by watching, you help support our site. Thank you so much. Now, if you're watching these videos, you probably care about geeky things like movies, television, comic books, toys, games, video games, you name it. You can go and subscribe right now to our YouTube channel to stay in touch and catch all the new videos, or check out our website at graphicpolicy.com. There's a nice link on this end of the video. But as always, thank you for watching. Keep on rocking and keep it geeky.